I continued working on uh, the different parts of the face on this. Um, again, I want to go over my color palette, which is essentially, again, a base flush tone, uh, light brown in certain areas to do washes and dustings. You can see around the nose and the contours of the muscles of the eyes. And what I've done is I randomly, uh, randomly came in and pierced out certain little muscles with this shield with the dark brown. Okay, and that actually gives you uh, your edge acuity as you're crawling along here. Same thing here, coming in with the shields, uh, with the dark brown. Um, and again, a little bit of black if you want to use it, but you don't want to get too carried away with the black. You can see I can uh, separate the nose there, spray a little bit with whatever shield you want to use, as I do right there uh, with the dark brown and, a, a, again, a tiny bit of black. Um, I'll zoom out here, kind of recap the lip here. You can see as you come down here, the shield can also be held right there to split the lip. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to come in and show you, um, I've got the left hand eyebrow set up. I'm going to come in and uh, show you how I did that and uh, maybe even scratch some highlights in the eyebrow as we move along here. Okay, as you can see here, what I've done is I've went in with a paintbrush um, and randomly put some, for a, a sable paintbrush, and I've randomly put some um, paintbrush strokes into this eyebrow and you can see those as I zoom in real real close there but actually what you can also do is you can come in with an exacto knife and you can scratch highlights into this too you don't want to get carried away when you're doing this you want them to be natural looking but uh, this is the other little things you can sneak in definitely so you can scratch highlights in here if they end up being a little bit too dominant um, you can actually dust back over them whatever need be. So this is what we'll do after the uh, tone of black has been put on there. And I can randomly come in here. And remember that the side of the X-Acto blade, um, an X-Acto knife is actually more effective uh, when you tilt it at a 45 degree angle. So don't forget that. You can come in there and randomly scratch highlights into that. And then again, if it's too dominant, um, you can dust back over them. Sometimes transparent blue is a real good idea when you're scratching uh, highlights um, on anything that's actually black. So let's go in and set up the other one. Okay, moving along, this is the right hand eyebrow here. I got some opaque black and a sable paintbrush. I'm going to go in. Sometimes I will like to, just to see how much I got on the brush, I'll test it on my finger there. I can go in and randomly paint these in. This is one thing that people that are new to airbrush don't realize that you can come in and use anything you want to establish uh, the colors, the tones, the textures. I call it the 70-30 rule. A lot of stuff is set up with an airbrush, but it's refined with sable paintbrushes, electric erasers, anything that you can use to add to the airbrush will actually help the overall look. Uh, Foot of note here when you do eyebrows, you don't want to do a unibrow and connect them, especially on an animated piece like this. But um, even if you're doing a normal portrait of Marilyn Monroe or whatever, you want to make sure that you stay true to the flow and the cross hatching of an eyebrow. Sometimes it will cross hatch a little bit. Just make sure it angulates a little bit. And later on, I will come down here and maybe put some. Uh, down the bottom part of the eye. I'm going to load up some opaque black. You need both in composition. You need this to look somewhat fuzzy. And again, you need uh, certain amounts of crispness and scratching of highlights for it to be believable. So the airbrush basically just kind of fills this in, adds a little bit of drama on the outskirts of this. These are little feather strokes. Okay, and for the sake of time, again, I will come in here, and normally I would let this dry a little bit more. I can come in. This is one thing really good about uh, canvas. But you can come in here and scratch until the cows come home. It's still going to look pretty good. You can, again, you can scratch on car hoods. 
uh, the clear coat just has to bury what's called burying the edges in the clear coat. So you can see how all this presupposes layering, layering in the, in the hair of the eyebrow here. And again, what I may do is come back with some transparent blue just to kind of calm this down a little bit and subdue it. If your exacto knife skips on you, you want to make sure you check how sharp your blade is and so on. I'll scratch a few highlights in here. Some little dagger strokes with this. And that's basically how you set it up. I'll come in here and tint this. And next what I'm going to do is come in with some transparent blue. Now, one thing you need to do with this transparent blue is you need to make sure that all of the uh, opaque black is out of there, um, of your airbrush, because when you're chasing a transparent color behind an opaque color, they really just intermix and you won't get the true punch of the tint when you're going and doing something like this. So I'm going to test my flow here off to the side, make sure i got a nice uh, clear transparent blue. I just want to lightly calm these down a little bit, blend them back into the surface. This is more of a, a little commercial effect, really, um, presupposing a certain coolness within a lighting uh, array. So just calm that down a little bit. I just need to knock the white down. I don't need to kill this with blue. It doesn't really look cheesy, but um, just knock that down a little bit here. And that looks like it's good enough for now. I might come back later on and mess with it more. Zooming out here, you kind of see how that uh, looks a little bit more believable with the eyebrows. And what I will do is come in these areas and fray them out uh, and detail these out a little bit more. And then we will move on to the hair. Okay, moving on to the hair. Um, hair is one of the harder things to do in portraits. Um, this one is not that involved, uh, how the hair flows in this piece. Again, you're gonna sneak in a sable brush. You're gonna come in here and put some uh, freehand strokes. This is definitely not that hard to do. I think Shirley Temple or something like that would be a lot more challenging. But you want a combination of uh, freehand strokes with the sable brush. And also I'm going to come here with the airbrush in a second and uh, start coloring this in a little bit. So these are really just kind of reference points and warm in the shade and do things. I may have to go in and rework certain areas if I oversaturate. Uh, uh, a bend or a contour in the hair. Just kind of sets it up line acuity, uh, really crisp line acuity with the softness of the airbrush. So, um, let me get uh, some black loaded up in here. Again, this is opaque black. And again, never jeopardize the image. Always go off to the side and uh, test your flow a little bit. Let me zoom in so everybody can see what I'm doing here. Okay, yeah, so we got something like that set up. And um, Salvador Dolly's hair is usually pretty thin on top, so I don't want him looking like Elvis, so I'll have to be careful about how much. I think what I'm going to do actually is go ahead and base coat this all black just to start off. And notice I'm still wisping. It's a real big thing to get in the habit of wisping your paint and not do what I call cry lining back and forth. This is one crazy guy. Even his hair was crazy. You can see he's noted um, for how his eyes look. That's, I think, fundamentally how people spot him. I can just protect this area, uh, the flesh tone area. And that's, again, why these are all called loose masks. You protect the areas that you're painting. And sometimes you may have white line that sneaks in between. Uh, one color, the edge of one color, um, and the edge of another color. i just seen I have some uh, mask in here I need to remove. I did not catch that, so that stuff will sneak up on you. Definitely don't want to clear coat over that. Get that off as some evil little tape edges. So let's say if I have some white line that's exposed like that, I'll actually come in here and let the paint catch up to the surface. Even though canvas is pretty nice to airbrush on, that's a big thing that people have to understand is you have to let the paint um, catch up with the surface and put a little bit more concise edge on here. 
I'm basically just kind of fill this in. That's what I'm doing. It's almost like a, um, uh, a bugle or a horn or something. I'm leaving the middle of this kind of voided. I can come in here and I'm superimposing this as I go here. Uh, from the way I've seen hair a lot in the future, I can go in the little funky edges here. <clears throat> this may even uh, make him look younger. And I can also trap the back end of the hair like this. Come down. Just kind of roll around here. Keeping as much dimension as I can when I'm doing this. I don't think I just want to put strands in here. So that's giving me kind of the look I'm going for. Let me nail down this exposed area over here. Fill that in. Again, that's why these are called freehand shields. As in the eyebrows uh, down here, I will definitely go in with this hair and I will tint it with blue. I think we all get a kick on how blue look against black, especially on hair. Anything from a picture of Elvis to uh, a cartoon or something like this. I mean, blue is always a good compliment. And now I can go in, since I have a detail nozzle, I can do some random freehand strokes. And I might even sneak in a fan brush later. Hopefully everybody knows what a fan brush is to develop more texture in the hair. <clears throat> Again, what you're seeing on camera, as far as the luminosity of the, not only the color, but the, uh, the graininess of a texture is a lot better in person than it is on camera sometimes. You really can't appreciate it until you've seen it up close. So that's basically uh, how I set up the top part of his hair. I'll zoom out a little bit. <clears throat> and coming down to the bottom part here, I will start uh, freehanding this and all the little weird um, bends and torques that he has uh, on the side of his hair too. So that's the top part. We'll go ahead and go to the side of his face uh, and continue the hair down. A uh, note of mention also too before we go to the side of the face um, is that you definitely can go in here and you can scratch uh, a pattern in the hair here. Now when I'm scratching the exposed or the void part which is the highlight of the hair, I'm scratching really lightly. It's so easy to dig in and you always want to make sure that you're getting the paint off the blade as much as possible because you'll have um, a more finite scratch and it'll look more professional I think. I'm just going to come in here and I will dust over this with blue, kind of work my way around. Notice how I'm twisting or keeping this uniform as I crawl towards the back of this. These are little crescent scratches. And then I will tint over that with blue in a few seconds here. And actually calm that down a little bit. I also do some more freehanding. And we'll zoom out. You can see it's taken on a pretty good um, tone with the muscles and the form and all that type of stuff in the face. Uh, the black actually is a good counterbalance for um, the flush tones. Uh, it's always a good thing when you come in with that black and you start scratching highlights and using paint brushes. It's just an overall good uh, compositional thing to do and uh, a good counterbalance for all the, the softness of the flesh tones. I guess that's what I'm saying uh, when you're sneaking in all these little uh, detail tricks. So the side of the face here um, is where you're getting into a lot of free handing. And I will start off here by just uh, dusting this in. The trick to hair, to be honest with you, is you have to just uh, Stay true to what you see, not what you think you see. And um, it's real easy to overwork hair. Hair is basically sculpted in its essence. You don't want to um, come in and put stripes all over the place. Uh, hair is um, a lot of dagger strokes. And what I'm trying to do in this case is uh, try to stay as soft as I can on the hair. I will come in with a paintbrush and uh, freehand paint some uh, hair strands like so. I'll go ahead and do one now just to show you what I'm talking about. But you want a combination of both. That's what some people will not do. See how I'm painting the hair in also. And you can uh, set up the whole composition of how the hair is flowing with a paintbrush like this. And then uh, fill it in with an airbrush if you want to. One thing I will tell you um, is that Createx Black, at this point anyway, um, is not a real popular paint. It tends to be very grainy 
A lot of people prefer Aquaflow paint and uh, some of the other high-end illustration paints. I know Aero Flash is a good paint. Badger makes a good white and a good black if you're um, doing a lot of freehanding in the hair. So don't think it's you if uh, your paint's not flowing and it's kind of grainy. It's probably the paint. Um, you can add different things if you go to my website uh, on how to make your paint flow better. And there's a lot of little sneaky ways that, that you can uh, concoct 50% uh, water or 50% of whatever chemical to serve as a flow enhancer, basically. So I can come in here with the paintbrush, and hair is something you just have to be true to. Uh, you cannot lie with hair. If it doesn't have a true flow, um, it will uh, nip you in the butt at the end. So make sure. And, and what I'm doing here, if you want to set it up with a paintbrush, that's fine. I can come out in the back, put strands in this, and maybe fill it in with an airbrush. It's really all just a preference. Some people may come in, and I freehand it with the airbrush first, <coughs> and uh, do the paintbrush last. But really all hair is is you're layering and scratching and relayering and re-scratching and re-freehanding all the little elements that make it work. So I'll go ahead and finish this up and we will move on to the uh, eyeball over here on the side and I will uh, further complement the flesh tubs with a couple other colors which um, I may do it. I'm not sure. I'll see how it looks as I'm crawling along here but um, the basic flesh tone formula with this is again the powdery base uh, createx flesh tone. I've started sculpting some of the eye muscles with light brown. I pierced with dark brown and I may tint with a deep red or just a transparent gold, golden yellow. Um, I may do that, uh, but I may not. I'll just kind of see how dark it's getting as I crawl along here. Sometimes if you get too heavy on the tent, um, it will make it look a little bit too commercialized. And I want to keep a sense of realism as I'm crawling along here. Your hand, I don't know if the camera's pick, uh, picking this up that well, but your hand you can see has red in it. And uh, depending on how the light's uh, shining on your hand, it may have yellow, amber, ochre, uh, and so on. So we will crawl along here. I'm going to finish the hair up. Before I move along, I do want to show you real quick what I'm doing after the paintbrush strokes. I'm coming in and I'm putting some freehand airbrush strokes in just to kind of fill uh, this in a little bit. I've added a flow enhancer to this black because the black just tends to be way too grainy. It clogs on you, spits on you. Uh, even though my operating pressure is uh, you know, 50 and above when I'm working even this big, you want to make sure that if your paint's grainy, sometimes it's not the pressure, it's other things. So you can see how this fills this in, the paint brush strokes, zoom in, and it'll give you a nice little contrast. Maybe be hard for the camera to pick it up, but you need some softness and uh, some hard lines, which the paintbrush gives us. And again, we can come in and we can scratch the hair as we crawl along here. And it pops out even more, and I can tint over that with blue. So I will stop there, and we will now move over to the eye. Basically, I've set this up with masking tape. Again, your first couple layers of graphics, uh, I think masking tape is a good idea. When you take the tape off, make sure you um, hit it with a blow dryer, uh, medium fan, low heat, and um, take some goo gone and wipe the goo, uh, or the, the glue, or the... Uh, that the tape left. You can see that we've got that nice crisp edge and I'm even off shape here. What I can actually do is come in with my trusty little bird shield and get my blue back out and I don't know if you can see that but it's not a total circle. I can actually take my blue and spray that and carve it back out. So I will continue shading and um, we will definitely come down to the collar and uh, continue to roll along here. Final note here, adding color to the eye, um, which is otherwise brown, I will come in with an electric eraser and pit a highlight where it's appropriate as I will on the other eye. Try to keep my hand out of the camera's way as much as possible here.
as you can see on the collar here, I'm going to go ahead and keep using tape since I'm uh, still within my first uh, layer or two of graphics. Again, if that does not make sense thus far, layer or two means that you'll be able to see one or two layers of color. After that, it pretty much blocks itself out. Um, but with tape, I'm a big fan of tape on canvas because frisk and contact paper may or may not stick. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this and make sure that I'm doing my money cut here because I definitely do not want to have flesh tone showing through. And when I cut this out, I will um, kind of uh, freestyle some type of texture. I've not thought about it yet, but I might spray through something weird to create uh, a pattern that looks like it took a lot longer than it did. So basically, you can see I've isolated the uh, neckline here at the collar. And um, one thing that's good to know too is that if you have a straight line, you do not need to cut there. Just go ahead and put some tape down. Uh, and minimalize the cutting. Beyond that, what I'll do is take and build a tape wall. This is a nice little trick you learn from other instructors. And once I've built my tape wall, this will prevent overspray from crawling around. And I need to get my blue Walmart shop towel, spray some goo gone on it, and wipe all the impurities, glue, dirt, hair, all that type of stuff off the surface. And we will continue with the collar down. Okay, moving along here, I want to talk a little bit about color theory. Um, when I meet a new group for the first time, um, the biggest problems that I think that they have is not only uh, their paint lifting and craftsmanship, but another biggie is basically um, what color goes with what. And I really don't think you can totally teach uh, color theory in any type of uh, high impact class or um, even a milked out class. I mean, sometimes I think it takes years and years of practice to know what goes with what. Um, so. Uh, a good frame of mind here is that I'm working pretty neutral and muted. Um, I don't have any loud primary colors to this. So I'm going to keep that in mind when I'm applying um, the collar color here. So I'm going to go ahead. This is a color called Raw Sienna. Um, you can make with flesh tone. Um, let's say uh, some flesh tone, a little bit of light brown, a little bit of yellow. Um, and it stirs up to this color here. Kind of a Scooby Doo color. <coughs> And I'm definitely letting the paint catch up with the surface. I don't want to go in and work too heavy because it will bleed underneath this tape. Also, uh, a good airbrush artist, a disciplined airbrush artist, will come around here and keep the airbrush straight on, straight forward, so that you don't deviate and have overspray that might crawl up behind that tape. I can just tell, also take my hand over here, and we will almost call this done. Try to be classy with your colors. Airbrush, ten, uh, airbrush tends to be a really fantasy type art form. Nice little trick here. You can dry this with air, blow dryer, whatever. Um, we'll make sure this is dry before I put my uh, stencil on here, my textural little stencil. And try to keep in mind that a stencil is definitely different than a freehand template. Um, and I'm just going to go for a little bit of texture here. Uh, just to make it look like I spent more time than I did on it. Okay, I've taken some Elmer's spray glue here. I'm sorry, some Krylon spray adhesive um, right here. And at an arm's distance, I've sprayed this uh, little pattern here. And again, I'm just winging this. I, for the most part, know how this is going to look. I teach the stuff in my classes, but your surface has to be relatively dry for this to stick. So, if it doesn't stick, I might have to put some more on there. Bottom line is I don't want a ton. I don't want a ton of glue on here uh, to mix in with my paint and cause uh, problems with cross contamination later on if I seal this. So put a little bit of tape up here to support it. I don't need to uh, keep re uh, caking glue on there. Uh, one thing about patterns when you put a pattern up like this, um, make sure it's uh, flowing with the direction and shape of the segment that you're actually painting. Because if it's not. It may look kind of silly if it's a crisscross or whatever. I'm going to take some light brown, get all the water out of my airbrush, make sure it's consistent and flush. If it's not, I'm going to have to put another piece of tape on there or something. I'm going to come in here and keep my distance of perception on where I'm actually spraying when I'm doing this. I can kind of see the tape outline. 
you gotta look real, real close. Now it's very much worth it to work lightly and evenly when you're doing stuff like this, because if you start crylining and going back and forth, you could have barbells or patches, which will just totally run the symmetry of the pattern we're trying to create here. So it's gotta come along here, fade down. This is transparent light brown. Maybe this will look like a turtleneck. Maybe some kind of shirt pattern or texture. When you're doing Salvador Dali, when you're doing a painting of him, you can pretty much do anything. It should look pretty good. Notice again, I've not went back and forth real crazy like. Okay, I've kind of eyeballed it here, and I noticed that over here, I need to pop that out a little bit more. Keep your eyes on it. Look real close when you're spraying textures like this. You can spray through your lace or whatever floats your boat. Just make sure you can kind of see through it, that you don't have a double pattern. Uh, try to be as even and consistent as you can. Um, again, I like taping it on there so I can kind of lift it up and check and see what's going on. That's pretty much good to go. And I'm going to lightly pull my tape off of here. Never yank your tape off. You could lift paint. Throw that away down there. And I'm going to come around and just, the eye likes to be drawn in. So I'm going to take the light brown and just sculpt around this. But I'm going to need dark brown just to pop it out a little bit more. And that should be about it on the light brown. We'll zoom in a little bit, see how that looks. And this is, the, again, the fun part of airbrushing. What looks like you took forever to do something when you really, really didn't. So sneak some lace in or whatever you need to uh, to create a concentric pattern like this. I may tempt this with yellow, I may not, I'm just kind of winging it as I go here. So I'm going to go ahead and load up some dark brown. And with my dark brown loaded in the airbrush, I'm going to go ahead and, again, test your flow off to the side. And I'm going to go on top of the light brown, but again, kind of eyeball, eyeball the light brown to make sure <clears throat> that it has caught up with the surface. Because if you keep taking too much paint underneath this tape, even though it's tape, it will not be forgiving, and eventually as a breaking point, you can see it will start to waffle. So I'm going to just finish off my light brown here. I'll go ahead and marginalize the bottom part of his little sweater, or his turtleneck, here. And I will debate if I want to come in with some yellow or not. I won't really make that decision um, until I actually take the tape off and see what happens from there. And after I've got my dark brown on there, I'm going to go ahead and start lifting the tape here. It's going to be a crab shoot on the bleeding, if the bleeding uh, did come through the tape or not. Again, sometimes what you can do is take some matte finish and rub it on your fingers. And it should. And then smear around the tape before you paint. Because again, matte finish is a transparent resin. And it should prevent white line and bleed spots and so on and so on. I should be able to cover up any little uh, imperfections that are going on here because I have to go in and finish sculpting out this hair. So I'm not real concerned about that. There's going to be a ton of hair down here flinging around and moving. So I'm going to go ahead and finish off the hair now. The mustache um, looks very Mr. Potato Head. Looks like someone just stuck a mustache on there. So what I'm going to do is come in and freehand this out a little bit. Put some fine strokes in here just to loosen it up a smidge, as I will over here. And yes, I'll definitely be coming in and um, with, with the sable paintbrush and adding uh, to the uh, mustache with the texture there to zoom out a little bit. You can see how this will break it up, make it look a little bit more natural. And I might even be goofy and come in with a, like a little white highlight. Um, to make it look like it's a sheen, like he just greased it down or something like that. If I'm feeling brave at the end, I'll come in with some white. Okay, so basically that's what we're doing to loosen all this up. And the same rule always applies where you can definitely scratch um, texture into the mustache and so on. It's probably one of the things I'll do at the very, very end here. Um, just to pop it out. He side of the face. There's also um, some random little hairs coming around here. So I gotta be careful that I don't get too carried away, but 
kind of freehand those in. Again, hair is a matter of sculpting more than anything and constantly looking over to see or, or to paint exactly what you see. I'm going to go ahead, since I have light on light in this area here of the face, I'm going to take a shield and kind of blacken the side of that so I can split the face from the hair that's coming around at an angle there. And this is one of the three quarter dimensions that really works because this has a three quarter view of this face. Again, contorted with a 15 millimeter lens. And some people say that these types of images are maybe even uh, done in a program called Goo, uh, where you can just take anybody's face and uh, contort it and make it give it that spoon slash uh, fish eye look here. So these all come out, and I'm going to leave that alone for now. And again, in your nature, you want to jump around and make sure that you don't overwork any particular area. Here's another area below the left hand side of the mustache where I'm going to come in with a piece of contact paper. I just kind of need to get in and out uh, with this. I don't need to do a lot of masking, but I have an, um, an edge concept here where I do not have a shield that's going to fit it. I could take forever trying to sculpt it out, but I'm just going to cut this out quickly. A lot of professional illustrators will actually cut edges as they go. Again, you learn stuff like that from Mark Fredrickson. I, I think he's hands down probably the best there is, but um, I got my contact paper on here. This will give me the edge acuity that I need to go in and fix and blend areas out, but also give me a safeguard um, to continue sculpting this hair without getting into my uh, nice little color pattern that I did here. So I'm just going to come in and I can be pretty liberal in here. <coughs> all the way around and again this is all I'm looking is to uh, establish an edge here that counterbalances the other side of this piece now watch your overspray up here this part of the mask is uh, if I catch that it's going to be pretty annoying to have to go in there and try to fix it so Go ahead and start freehand some of this. And that should give me enough play to where I can at least take the mask off now and totally freehand the rest of it. All I was wanting was a basic edge there. So you can see how that pops that part off the surface. And basically just saves you a lot of time. And with commercial illustrating, you better get used to this cutting or uh, you're not going to have much fun, definitely. And that will fly for that area. Um, and at the end I will come in and fine tune with scratching and uh, after I scratch the white highlights I will tint those down with transparent blue. Hopefully that makes sense as we go along here. Okay, cruising along here. I've got the hair working a little bit better on each side of this collar. Um, I'm also going to continue working with dark brown um, around the neck here to counterbalance and match or just to keep my continuity with how the face is flowing into the, the neck area here. But before I go ahead and, uh, go ahead and refine uh, the neck area, I need to come in here and do something with this uh, collar. It looks somewhat boring, so I got my dark brown. And what I can do is just put a couple little creases here, maybe one crease, um, just to give it a little bit more of a roll and not look so flat. That's what's the, the beauty of these transparent paints, is you can come in and um, once the pattern's on there, you can pretty much uh, skim something through here. So that's the edge. And I will make this just kind of roll around here a little bit. Just give it like a little crease or a buckle of the fabric and then get a little bit closer and put a roll into that. And this can actually taper off here like it's coming around. See how you can actually start an edge there and then continue sculpting it around at the neckline. So that just gives a little bit more interest. Makes it look a little bit more believable. Kind of like a turtleneck or something. 
After you play with these uh, textures and knobs, you'll see there's a lot of things you can do with them pretty quickly and effortlessly. Now, once I've done that, I'm letting the paint catch up with the surface. I can go in and I can pierce that out a little bit more. And it brings out the dimension in this. You see how I waited. I can just keep hogging paint on there time after time. And if you want to get real funky, you can actually roll all the way around here. And now you've got kind of like a lip, like this turtleneck. It actually brings the eye in a little bit more. I'm also going to spray the bottom side of this just to bring it into marginal sense, I think. And that's that. What I'm going to do next is the same dark brown. I think I'm going to come in here, since the camera's already set up to see the working area that I'm in here. I'm going to come in and with the dark brown, just want to pierce little areas here. I'll zoom in a little bit if I can. Start in this area here. Come in and just lightly pierce out these edges. You can see how, again, like I did earlier, we had light brown, but now I can come in with the dark brown. It really just makes this all work in the end. And then I can taper edges out, kind of fade them out like that. Same thing down here, I can knuckle my shield and just give it more color entrance, uh, interest altogether. I'm going to back off here. You can kind of see how I need to balance all this out. And basically I'm just going to kind of guess. Uh, the photo reference I'm working from, the ear isn't real obvious. It's kind of weird whatever what was drawn here. So actually I'm going to come in and just uh, presuppose there's a break there and maybe it starts to indent there. Again, this is all sketching. <clears throat> Come in with my little shield here. A little crease, one, like that. I can come in and just bend that around. And we can pretend that that ear is actually going somewhere getting lost up there in his hair. Now, after that, again, I'm letting the paint catch up with the surface. I can come in and we, we know that that was the edge right there. When I did that, there was a little edge that I put right there. You pull the template off, and you do the wash, and that will give an indication of an earlobe. So, I'll let that dry definitely and come back in and I pierce that out with a dark brown. Okay, and with some dark brown loaded up in my airbrush, I'm going to pierce out this ear a little bit. Remember, we went from uh, flesh tone to light brown, and then we're going to pierce with dark brown. You can see that actually pops it out. Come in here and get this little niblet section. That will develop the lobe of the ear. And I'm going to do a little wash here. And also, Remember, I, I, what I've done is I've prefaced a shadow underneath the uh, mustache here uh, with light brown. That gave me kind of a reference point on where to put the dark brown. Definitely do not want to come in here with black. And this is the, one of the best examples that shadows are basically the absence of light. They're not always black. So the dark brown is going to be the underlying value of the uh, shadow here. I'll go ahead and zoom out. You can see it kind of Looks pretty cool there. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'll continue working around the neck area here. Um, I guess one of the main things I need to uh, let people know is that when you're doing this type of work, it takes a lot of patience. You don't need a lot of distractions whatsoever. I've not really ruined any particular area yet because I've been so careful. But when I come in here, and for whatever reason I get paint spatter or whatever going on, uh, I can come in here with some white and a blow dryer. Uh, some thick white, some unmixed uh, white right out of the bottle in a blow dryer and kind of get in and out and do uh, reconstructive surgery. You will have a titanium shift of blue because um, white actually has a little bit of blue in it. But don't freak out if you do for whatever reason uh, get paint somewhere. You, uh, you have the best tool in the world to fix it. That's what airbrushes um, do is they fix and re-blend things. Coming along the neck here 
come in just a little bit. Got some real dark areas over in here. This is where you definitely want to pay attention to your photo reference and not overwork these areas. I'm kind of looking at the top of the face as I'm shading these. As a, once you've gone in too dark, it's pretty too much. So I will jump around and finish off with my dark brown here around the neck. Okay, getting into the fine tuning part of this, which is usually the last stage. What I'll do is I'll come into the hair area here with um, uh, some sable paint brushes and again balance out the fuzziness of the airbrush because again I still have the freehand airbrush strokes down here and over here so that's something that I'll do at the end. Another thing is coming in with an electric eraser. Um, this is a Helix electric eraser. It's around eight or nine dollars at Office Max or any hobby store. Um, a lot of people have used um, uh, Dremel tools and so on at low RPMs or they'll put uh, the head of a Dremel tool on top of the electric eraser, uh, tape it down and let it spin around and so on. I, I, I think that if you have a lower RPM it's usually more effective because you can actually go right into the canvas and so on. Okay, So what I'll do is I'll just dig into the chin a little bit here just to show you how you can create the detail. This is something that's very time consumptive so you basically um, for the purposes of the video I'll just kind of preface on the chin here how you can take paint off of the surface to create the texture in the skin. You can see how it's coming off there. Now one footnote when you're doing something like this is that your surface actually has to be prepared with uh, either gesso um, again, this works with uh, uh, spray gesso from Krylon, but two or three good coats, uh, finely sanded, will allow you to skip over your surface to create the pits and the highlights in the skin. Flush needs texture to work, so you can see, I'll try to zoom in a little bit more here. You can see that how that actually um, creates a sense of realism and the texture in the skin. Again, very time consumptive, I could easily spend another um, three or four hours probably detailing this thing out but you have a choice again this is a preference on if you want to do this or not but it's really a choice on if you want to uh, create more realism or if you just want um, a basic animation or illustration look which I think uh, either one would serve their purpose well but uh, it's kind of fun when people can even get real real close on something and it still, uh, still looks even that much more realistic so I'll continue doing this with the electric eraser, uh, taking paint off the surface, and continue uh, going in with the paintbrush and uh, refining the, the hair and um, the eyeball and all the little changes that I'm going to need to modify uh, to, to make this thing balanced out. Okay, this is a nice little interesting part of the face here, the uh, forehead lines, which are very well exaggerated. Uh, I can come in here with some freehand preface washes here as I can here as I can here alright that sets it up and then we take our little shield we can go one two and then again try to torque it around stay a little bit more uniform if you can and three you can see how that pops out the uh, forehead area a lot then they all taper down as these actually taper out this way, it's a little, a little feather stroke. I think I've shown enough times how important the dagger stroke is. That's definitely a cool little area to work in here. Go ahead and soften this edge up against the hair as it um, uh, protrudes into the, um, the flesh tone area. And now the hair, I've already, again, earlier scratched that. With my exacto knife, I'm going to take my nice, cool, uh, really clean airbrush, dark blue, and just lightly knock that white down a little bit. And again, if I kill it, if I put too much on there, then again, I can do this. I can get back in here and maybe do some, a few more scratches, not that much more. Just pop this back out. 
it's about where I need it, and this does, these highlights do taper off too, back here. They look pretty bold on camera, but in the room here that I'm at, they do not look dominant at all. So these actually are still pretty strong. Go ahead and dust those down with glue too, just a smidge. Hit the eyebrows a little bit. Okay, wrapping up here, this image is uh, fundamentally complete. I could still go in and um, keep detailing probably with the electric eraser and so on. You can see how you can even scratch more highlights in the hair as you crawl along here. Um, it's really just a preference. Stay true to the photo reference as always. As we pan over here a little bit, you can see some of the textural uh, diversity you get when you're scratching with the uh, electric eraser. So. That actually comes in handy. This is a, probably a better area over here as you're jumping in there with that. Uh, depending on how well the uh, surface is prepared, it's going to allow you a more uniform, uh, abrasive uh, scratch with the electric eraser. Um, but again, it's it, you, you can just kind of sneak it in there a little bit. You don't have to get carried away with the scratching. But uh, I've also went in over here on the eyeball, and you can see. I didn't use a lot of black, I just used a little bit of gray. Um, again, it would be really cheesy to go in and outline that with black. Um, it's actually a really watery gray. Add a little bit of veins to the eyeball there. And uh, call that a day. The shadow underneath the eyeball is actually not black. It's a little bit of uh, really watery gray with transparent blue. So panning out here, uh, I will call this done for now. As far as the video presentation, I hope you enjoyed this and hopefully you understand that something like this comes together relatively quickly dependent on just the smoothness of the flesh tones and how that smoothness of the flesh tones is manipulative against uh, cool backgrounds and how the texture pulls um, out with the electric eraser and uh, overall just a fun image to work in. I think as far as one last mention of color theory, try to remember that on camera here I'm in RGB so it looks very red. Um, so you always have a preference to go in and dust this with some transparent deep red or uh, transparent yellow. But again, sometimes that will negate the realism. Um, beyond that, um, how busy you get in an image is relevant. Uh, you want to try to save marginal space as I've crawled around here and not violated any margins and uh, I think overall this was a successful video it is my first video there will be more to come um, and thank you very much